Control was released by Remedy Interactive in September of 2019 from the developers of Max Payne and Alan Wake and the brainchild of Remedy's creative director, Sam Lake. Roll spot. Taking influence from the collaborative wiki page detailing the fictional corporate entity called the SCP Foundation, who secures, contains, and protects from various unexplained phenomena that defy the laws of physics. However, with Control, I do believe that there is something extra going on here, and I think it has to do with Half-Life. As I played through Control, shooting, reading, and floating my way through its world, I started to notice a lot of similarities. I felt as though I had been here before, like I'd played this before, but not in a negative or diminishing way because I think Control is a fantastic game when it runs properly. Similarities I realized were between it and one of my favorite games of all time, Valve's 1998 PC classic Half-Life. After your first foray into the original Half-Life game, it should come as no surprise that it would go on to change the landscape of how developers looked at story and FPS mechanics in video games. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Half-Life DNA that I think is inside Control, and how even their differences point towards the inspiration. Full spoilers for both games, this is your warning. Jessie Faden is your everyday girl who, even after the event that would be the catalyst for the storyline that takes place during the game, grows up a very normal, working daily labor jobs at one point becomes a janitor life. Similarly, Gordon Freeman, the MIT graduate theoretical physicist, is a professor turned research assistant with nothing much to his name other than the goods in his locker. Both of these everyday normies like us end up being thrown into these bizarre world ending scenarios that get weirder and weirder the more they go on. Both Jesse and Gordon's stories are largely influenced by a mysterious governmental entity. At the beginning of Half-Life, Gordon's taking a transit from his dormitory to the Black Mesa Research Facility located somewhere in New Mexico, where his day is beginning with an experiment. The ride's accompanied by a pre-recorded message playing over the intercom of the transit detailing safety logistics and important information for the employees of the Black Mesa Research Facility. 93 degrees, with an estimated high of 100. Black Mesa compound is maintained at a pleasant 68 degrees at all times. The halls are barren and sterile, filled with scientists clad in lab coats, some of which will go on to play huge roles in the Half-Life story, including Eli Vance and Isaac Kleiner, as well as one strange-looking man with a briefcase and a blue suit. Owned by the Research Corporation of the same name, who's helmed by the U.S. government and the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Mission, the research done at the facility covers a wide gamut of sciences, from experimental propulsion to genetics. In control, we are Jesse, navigating the maze that is the oldest house, an innocuous building in the heart of New York City owned and operated by the Federal Bureau of Control. The oldest house doubles as the headquarters as well as the research facility for the Bureau to conduct experiments on paranatural phenomena. It's right here at the beginning of the games where you can start to see the similarities through setting. Where Gordon passes fellow white-robed researchers in the halls, Jesse finds videos and tracks down her researchers like Casper Darling and Frederick Langston. Speaking of, both games feature a large focus on the employees turned allies in way of multiple run-ins with them along their journey. If it wasn't for Gordon, Dr. Kleiner and Dr. Vance would never have made it out of Black Mesa alive. But it's Dr. Vance who charges Gordon with getting out of Black Mesa alive to send help, as well as uses his retina scan to get Gordon out of the first area. Gordon more actively receives help from security guard slash work friend Barney Calhoun. Barney is your typical blue collar worker who joins the friend group of Gordon and Dr. Kleiner before the events of the game. Throughout your playthrough of Half-Life, Barney will show up to offer his assistance taking down former researchers who've turned into head-crabbed beanie zombies from other dimensions, all while offering celebratory remarks when one of your enemies falls. Man, did you see that shot? It also falls in the hands of a few surviving scientists in the Lambda Complex sector of Black Mesa to send Gordon to the other dimension where he can try and stop the big bad which begins the final chapter of the game. 
Back in New York City, as our newfound protagonist Jessie Faden explores her way through government documents, disturbing children TV shows, and also shooting through hordes of interdimensional beings, she's given quests, both side and main, from employees of the oldest house. First encountering the janitor, Ati, who sets off just the right amount of red flags, and then surprisingly less helpful and more disturbing director of the FBC, Zachariah Trench. Jesse finally finds someone who won't speak in riddles in the form of Emily Pope, the facility's last researcher after her boss Casper Darling goes missing. Emily helps Jesse find the right people and guides her through the shifting maze that is the oldest house. Unlike Half-Life though, Jesse gets assistance from a handful more employees, including Helen Marshall, head of operations and all-around badass. I mean, look at this gun she just carries around. Frederick Langston, the supervisor for an area of the Bureau called the Panopticon, where all the objects of power are held and rituals are performed by Langston to keep the objects calm. Simon Arish, the security chief of the maintenance sector, an all-around adorable man, however slightly large his head is for his body, and many, many more. Both our heroes here are successful not only in their own talents or abilities, but because for some reason when disaster strikes a government facility, the employees really take care of each other and those around them. There might be something to read into there. So I've touched on a few of these aspects already, but in this section we're going to dive deeper into what exactly is going on in each of these games and their relationship in the terms of otherworldly elements. Both events that cause Gordon and Jesse to jump into the role of hero are mistakes made by higher-ups at the aforementioned government facilities. In the case of Gordon and Half-Life, the head of Black Mesa, Dr. Breen, as well as an unknown third party, guy in the blue suit, were responsible for causing the Lambda disaster, where in Jesse's situation, it was caused by the former head of the FBC, Zachariah Trench. The Black Mesa incident, or the Lambda incident, took place in the Anomalous Materials Department of the Black Mesa Research Facility and was carried out by two researchers, as well as Gordon Freeman. Sometime before the events of Half-Life, an extra-dimensional realm known as Zen was discovered and scouted by what the company called the Lambda Team. As the inhabitants of Zen were immediately hostile to the Lambda Team, the job was considered extremely hazardous. However dangerous it was to enter Zen, the team did manage to extract and study several samples from the exotic world one of them being sample EP0021, of which very little is known. The reason for this is because before the experiment that Gordon was going to take place in, a memo was sent down to Dr. Colette Green from the supervision team stating that they were more interested in a newly acquired sample for testing. The largest and purest sample Lambda team had been able to acquire, sample GG3883. Though already revealed to show unexpected spectral fluctuations, was ordered by the supervision team to replace the original EP0021, even though this was in clear violation of the standard anomalous materials handling protocol. To make matters worse, the administrator for Black Mesa, Wallace Breen, sent another message, this one on the day of the procedure. We've boosted the anti-mass spectrometer to 105%. Bit of gamble, but we need the extra resolution. The administrator is very concerned that we get a conclusive analysis of today's sample. I gather they went to some length to get it. The research team was now to overclock the anti-mass spectrometer, and instead of running it at its safe range of 90%, would be turned up to 105%. All concerns of the researchers were overruled, and even though Gordon was 30 minutes late to work that day, it wasn't enough time for the researchers to second guess and prevent any unforeseen consequences. In the world of control, there are three types of paranatural occurrences, altered items, objects of power, and altered world events. Altered items are ordinary objects that have had paranatural forces acted upon them, like this fridge that kills you if you stop looking at it, or this stoplight that will teleport you random distance away from it if you approach it while its red light is active. These are the items kept by Langston that I spoke about earlier. Objects of power are similar to altered items, but with one defining characteristic. They can be bound to by people classified by the board as paratalterians, which are people with the unique ability to wield the paranatural powers. People with this special ability can use these powers to traverse what's known as the astral plane, a place described in game as the manifestation of our subconscious mind seen in game as an endless white void with floating landmarks from our conscious world to traverse. These objects of power are tied to an inhabitant of the astral plane, the thing really in charge of this whole operation, the board. 
Only spoken to through Jesse's mind and in broken riddles, we see the manifestation of the board as an ominous upside down triangle. There's also the service weapon, the haunted gun that's like the sorting hat for directors of the FBC, the hotline, an old red telephone turned object of power used for the director to talk to the board, Jesse's a paratalitarian and uses powers through the game, and the former. Yeah, we don't have time to explain that. The Black Mesa incident had ramifications that rippled through the entire world, even after Gordon is sent to Zen to try and stop it. Zen acts as a plane of existence connecting two or more dimensions, and is the place where all the enemies that you've been fighting up to this point have come from during the incident. A world made up by smaller asteroid-like foundations that float endlessly through the void and contain a complex ecosystem of flora and fauna. Gordon must travel and fight through this harsh landscape, fighting poisonous flowers, lakes of toxic liquid, and Gonark. That can't be safe for YouTube. Eventually, Gordon stands face to face with the supreme leader of Zen, a large being resembling that of a fetus with a head so large it has to be held up by cords coming from the back of it, and its legs stretched downward so slightly they look almost amputated, a being known as the Nihilinth. Finally, the man in the suit, known by fans as the G-Man, shows up to speak to you about continuing to work under his employment. If the player chooses to not take his offer and stay on the train, you fail your mission and the game loads your most recent save. The only way to complete the game is to accept the G-Man's offer. Jessie encounters it only mere minutes into her visit to the oldest house. A deep red essence floods the room, casting black shadows around the room's harsh corners. FBC employees hanging in the air, limp and lifeless. They repeat words in a sort of incantation or poem. Suddenly they awake and gravity pulls the beings to the floor as they start to attack Jessie. The hiss, as Jessie calls it, is slightly harder to explain than Half-Life's interdimensional experiment gone wrong. So this is my best and most simple explanation of the hiss. Everything in the universe has a natural frequency or resonance. The chair or couch you're sitting on as well as the screen you're watching this on and you yourself have a natural frequency. So we can assume that the oldest house has a natural frequency as well. And this is confirmed by the appearance of the hiss. See, the hiss are an alien entity it doesn't have a human feature like many of our interpretations of what non-human-like species would look like. This entity is a force of resonance that created the exact frequency needed to invade the building, known as the Oldest House, which as we found out through the story, acts as a kind of mitigating monolith separating our subconscious world where the hiss is emanating from and our conscious one. The name The Hiss comes from the sound its frequency makes as it attempts to use other wavelengths to possess its listeners and have them repeat the mantra Jesse heard earlier. The thorns of the source is so attentive. How is this cause? What a pearl with yellow and red in the eye. From Jesse's own lines, it sounds like an earworm that you can't get out of your head. The question of how The Hiss found the oldest house and its frequency leads us to our former director of the Federal Bureau of Control, Zachariah Trench. Earlier I spoke of Jesse's ability to live a normal life after the event that would set the narrative of the game off, and that is an AWE that took place in Jesse's hometown as a young girl. In this case, a dump site played in by 10 to 11 year old kids seemed to have shifted as Jesse states, revealing a path inwards deeper into the landfill. It's here that an old school slide projector is found, as well as eight slides. Six slides were burnt, and one came with its own being of resonance, one that would find a vessel inside Jesse known as Polaris. However, that leaves one known slide that is missing from record. Well, it turns out Jeremiah Trench took the one slide for himself, and the slide contained the hiss, and it had already started to infect his mind. The research teams at the FBC could enter the slide containing Polaris, known as Slidescape 36. Trench would join the research team on these expeditions, it's one such expedition that he claimed to hear another frequency other than Polaris in the slide suddenly, like a needle, drilling in, cutting through the containment suit, reverberating in the base of my skull and my whole being. So we've gone through pretty good detail about how the two games Control and Half-Life are similar, but what I find most interesting is something I discovered while writing the script. When looking even deeper at these similarities, you can see almost polar opposites. 
Yes, Gordon and Jesse are both nobodies, but obviously they aren't exactly the same because Gordon's a man and Jesse's a woman. It gets even weirder when you find that Jesse grew up in Maine and Gordon, Washington, literally opposite sides of the country. Then even further still, the two were both in their late 20s during the timeline of the games, Jesse being 28, Gordon 27. Now we're going to get a little meta here, but they just keep coming, so stay with me. Half-Life takes place in first person, where Control takes place in third person. They both use guns as one main form of combat, but Jesse's service weapon can take the form of many types of guns and has refilling unlimited ammunition from the start where Gordon gets progressively more alien weapons but starts out with your regular pistol and shotgun. Thematically, the games follow similar beats in the way of early foreshadowing of what they're going to be tasked with and their role in future events. Look at the scene when Gordon gets his hazardous material suit and when Jesse acquires the service weapon from Trench. Where did I These scenes are both used to demonstrate the power that the player now has to be the hero for the story. We can then look at the direction the heroes go in their games. In Half-Life, Gordon's tasked with making his way up to the surface, while Jesse finds her way down to the depths of the FBC into its foundation. And finally, the one that started this whole thing. Let's take a look at this scene from Control, where Jesse's trying to activate the machine that makes devices to keep the hiss away. Does that look familiar to you? Have you seen any other rock-like elements being battered with a beam of energy recently? Well, it should, because it's basically a smaller version of the anti-mass spectrometer hitting sample GG3883 during the Black Mesa incident, only this time, the rock being hit by a beam of energy creates a small inconvenience, whereas in Half-Life it almost destroys the entire world. The Black Mesa incident, or as it's more commonly referred to as the Resonance Cascade, Resonance, like that used by the Hiss? And are you really going to tell me that the G-Man isn't on some sort of interdimensional board? Look at this briefcase. He even speaks in broken riddles, just like the board. And the board employs Jesse after the story's conclusion, just like Gordon forced to take work from the G-Man. That's not enough to convince you, and I don't know what will. Only one thing remains. Time to choose. taking down former researchers who've turned into headcrab beanied zombies from other dimensions while offering celebrity. <laughs> That's a dumb line. What's your favorite game? Let's say Half-Life 2.